Hi there. I recently said that uh, the next time I had the opportunity to say ladies and gentlemen, I would say you foolish mortals instead, but it just feels awkward. Um, so my name is Alicia Sterling, and I'm the executive director at Geeks Without Bounds. Um, we support humanitarian open source technology in a range of different low resource situations. Uh, that includes um, disaster response situations, working in low resource countries like India and Tanzania and Uganda, and it also includes working in low resource communities in the United States, whether those are impoverished communities um, like parts of Baltimore or like um, the uh, indigenous communities on the reservations and territory lands in the United States. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, lessons that we learned this past year at Standing Rock. Um, so welcome to Standing Rock. Um, <laughs> I arrived in Standing Rock in uh, September of last year, and I left February 10th of this year. Uh, it was a most intense time. I'm going to be talking tomorrow about how we set up the internet at Standing Rock, uh, some of the reasons why a lot of people thought that there was no internet, even though there really was internet, uh, and, and the challenges that happened around uh, making all of that happen and keeping it work. But today I'm going to talk about sort of the broader issue of cyber war that happened at Standing Rock. Um, this is really a Cowboys and Indians story. Um, clicking doesn't work. You have to push the button. So our, <laughs> yes? For those of us who've been living under a rock, what might we have heard of Standing Rock Ah, okay, so if you heard about the no dapple uh, protests, or if you heard about water protectors, um, there is a pipeline uh, run by Energy Transfer Partners. That's the cast member up there. Yeah, boo, thank you very much. Um, uh, which is owned by Sonico now, uh, which is going to go um, across several states in order to bring um, shale uh, gasoline or shale petroleum uh, out to Indiana, um, although it connects in with other petroleum pipelines and, in fact, will be taking uh, the, the petroleum all the way down to the Gulf and being used for export. So their excuse about it being for all domestic, forget that one. Um, they say this is so safe. It will never, ever leak, ever, never, 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 ever, ever leak. We know it'll never, ever leak. You don't have to worry. Um, they were originally going to put it uh, through uh, uh, the place that starts with a B, uh, Bismarck. <laughs> we used to call it a Bismarck in camp, you know, because it's like so <laughs> abysmal. Um, <laughs> basically imagine a town that is like every American town squished into one town with nothing that's specific to that place. It has all the big back stores, all the, you know, strip malls, everything so generic. That is Bismarck in a, in a nutshell. Um, I, I apologize to anybody who loves Bismarck, but that was that, that was my impression on many, many uh, drives up to Bismarck to deal with various and sundry things. Uh, so the pipeline was going to go through Bismarck. The community in Bismarck said, no, no, don't put it through Bismarck. And so Energy Transfer Partners said, that's a great idea. We'll put it down here by the reservation instead. Nobody cares about the reservation. Right, don't put the pipelines through suburbia. Um, put, it, put it down there right by the reservation because nobody lives out there, right? Um, <clears throat> the problem is that even if we take out the issue of the reservation and the treaty land and the sacred lands that were there, that are there, 
were nothing. They're still there. They're still sacred. Uh, even if you take all of that out, this pipeline is going into the Missouri River. There are 18 million people downstream that get their water from the Missouri River. A leak in a pipeline that goes under the Missouri River is going to cause massive damage. So, you know, whether you support the indigenous rights side of this or not, we all drink water and we should be concerned about this. Um, at least that is my take. I, I recognize that that is a p political take, but that is my personal take on this matter. There's also, of course, the indigenous rights issue here that while energy transfer partners and the DAPL uh, business group tried to say, well, it's not really reservation land, so the tribe has no rights here. That is not true. Although it is true that it's not on the reservation, the pipeline is going um, less than a mile north of the reservation. Um, but what it is doing is going through treaty lands. Now, one of the things that a lot of non-Native people in America don't recognize or don't realize is that the treaties that we've made and the land that's actually the reservations, they don't match up. We kept squeezing them down onto smaller and smaller amounts of land and ignoring the treaties that we had. And so the Great Sioux Nation, as of 1851, should have been all of North Dakota, all of South Dakota, part of Wyoming, part of Montana, right? So in 1868, they shrunk that down. It's still supposed to be <laughs> half of North Dakota, almost all of South Dakota, parts of Wyoming and Montana. Um, and even though that 1861 treaty land is as big and vast as it is, they've still managed to squeeze the people down deeper and deeper. The, the last um, sh you know, shrinking of the boundaries of where uh, the Sioux and, it's not just the Sioux, there's the Sioux, there's the Hidatsa, there are other uh, tribal groups there, but the last time the Mandan, uh, the last time they were shrunk into new reservations was I believe 1933. So the current reservation boundaries, these are not boundaries that are set by treaties. These are not boundaries that are really legal. And the, the requirement for the, the government and the corporations to get permission from the signatories to that 1868 treaty still exist. So that's... That's our cowboys and Indians battle right there. Um, so who's involved? We've got the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Um, I really should have put uh, all of the different signatories to the 1851 and 1868 treaties. Um, we think about this as being an issue for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe because this is just outside of the boundary of their reservation. But the signatories are you know, multiple and one of the issues ongoing and, and continuing now is that although the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe has decided that they're no longer going to fight this pipeline with on-the-ground actions, the Cheyenne River Sioux uh, Tribes uh, has decided they're, they are signatories, they have the right to continue fighting this, and they actually do still, to, to this day, have a camp on the ground. Um, now, you can't go out there and just start participating now because it is an invite-only camp that they have uh, in order to keep it small and, and to sort of protect the community. But um, so that's our Indian side of the story. My black background disappeared. Holy cow. I've, this is why I don't do uh, <laughs> presentations. This is this is why I don't do slides. I can't do visual stuff. Um, this image right here, it, written in right white here with the black background that has disappeared. <laughs> this is Tiger Swan. Um, they are the evilest of evil as far as I'm concerned. Um, these guys are mercenaries. These guys are uh, security consultants who have... Uh, been working in Afghanistan, they've been working in Iraq, they've gotten in all sorts of trouble, they've, um, I mean, they've had criminal charges against, you know, some of their employees. 
for things that have happened overseas. Forget, you know, hey, let's have them work over here on US soil against innocent civilians. Um, and then we've also got, this is the Morton County Sheriff's Department. Not that you can see their logo very well, but you know, I just snagged it off the internet. Um, and then we have the National Guard, um, who the governor of North Dakota called in his National Guard. And that symbol up there is the Army Corps of Engineers. So the Army Corps of Engineers claims ownership of the land that our camp was on. Uh, the Ocheti Shakoen, the big camp. The one in that picture right there. Um, so this right here is the Cannonball River. Um, if you went just a little bit further off the side of the uh, image over there, you would see the Missouri River. This side of the river is the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. And the camp like that is behind my back as I'm taking this picture is the Rosebud Camp, uh, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe um, also had their own encampment here. Um, this is the main camp that everybody heard about, the Ocheti Shakoin camp. That was the big camp that got, uh, at its largest, had 20,000 people. It was, it was crazy, man. We were the third biggest city in the state. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to Standing Rock. I have to admit, um, I did not have the courage to take this photo from the other side of this barrier. Uh, on the night that I drove into camp, um, just at sunset, I came up to this barrier, but on the other side, and you can sort of see there's, there's a command center vehicle over here. There's, a, you know, there's, oh yeah, hey, look at that. Um, you can, you can sort of see the National Guardsmen over here. Uh, they are armed. There's also police cars on, on both sides that you can't really see with the other cars in the way. Um, but the, the barrier goes all the way out to the edge, all the way out to the edge on the other side. Uh, on, we're looking towards the north. So when you're coming into camp from Bismarck, you would be coming from that side down. And on the other side of that, there's a big sign um, that says, uh, prepare to stop information checkpoint. <laughs> Does this look like any information checkpoint you have ever seen in your life? So if you're white, which luckily for me I am because they don't you know, put in your ID that you're Jewish anymore, so I get to be white. And as you, you come up there and you look pasty like me, they say, have you been down this road recently? And if you say no, they say, well, we're just here to inform you that there's a protest down there and people camping and there's a lot of people walking on the road. So you should be careful and drive slowly, okay? All right, great, have a great day. <laughs> if you were not pasty like me, um, they would usually send you down that side road, making you take another hour and a half to get to camp. And that's if you were lucky. They would often, um, at that point, ask for ID, run people's ID. If they had any warrants, they would arrest them on the spot. Some people got arrested on bogus charges before they even got to camp. Uh, and so as early as August, people at camp were recommending that you did anything to avoid this if you were anything but pasty. Um, so one of the things I did at, at this particular time, I had a, a van, a six passenger van that you could pull out all the seats to put stuff into or put the seats back so that people could be there. And I did a lot of runs back and forth from camp to Bismarck to drop people off at the airport, pick people up from the airport, pick up equipment. Um, and one day I came across that barrier with um, a family, eight straw bales, 10 bags of groceries, uh, I don't know how many bags of laundry. Um, and the straw bales were covering up the, the area from where the driver's area is to the passenger's area. Um, 
So when I got there, they saw me and my, I call him a mess lab. She's a, <laughs> she's a black lab pit bull mix, and everybody knows that every mess lab needs a little pit bull in it. Um, they saw me and my dog, and were like, oh, what a cute dog. Have a nice day. <laughs> didn't even know the, notice the people in the back. I didn't do that on, like, I wasn't trying to smuggle people, but it was kind of cool. Uh, yeah, so this is the environment that you're coming into. The foreground. Oh, this thing right here? That's fuzzy. That was my oh, neck gosh. warmer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, um, not, not, not that you know this, but what was the conceivable justification for them to discriminate so blatantly? <sighs> okay. Just because yeah. they could. Right, just because they could. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, there was a lot more, there, there was a lot of, discrimination in the stores at, at like everywhere you went who was who was who was ostensibly in charge of the checkpoint the national guard the national the guard was in charge of that checkpoint now at different points there were different checkpoints with different people in charge of them so there were checkpoints at some point at some times that were uh, run by the Morton County sheriffs uh, this was the longest running checkpoint and that was a national guard checkpoint um, later on, we had a, um, a BIA checkpoint. Now, um, <laughs> this is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, now, growing up, my mom always called the BIA the Bureau of Incompetent Assholes. And I always had this like really bad, like, uh, BIA, hate them, hate them, right? The one time in my life I've ever been like, wow, the BIA is actually cool. So the, the BIA um, officers that were local to Standing Rock were actually, you could tell that they were personally supportive of us being there and they were, they were very nice, not just to the white folks, but to, to everybody. And there was one particular night after the raid on the North Camp, um, I think it was either the night after or two nights after the raid on the North Camp, where they had gotten the orders to send away sheriffs or state patrol. The <coughs> sheriffs and the state patrol were not allowed on reservation territory. And I have never seen cops so happy to send away other cops. It was hilarious. <laughs> so <coughs> what you see here is um, one of the command vehicles. Um, now, as you came down from that checkpoint, there were several of these, and they were not always in the same place on any given day. They might be in different locations. So there's one of them, and here's another one. Oh, these are bad guys. Um, yeah, these are, these are bad guys. Uh, and, and they have lots of equipment on them, which you expect. They have to communicate with each other, right? Um, but, but here's the thing. The morning after I arrived in camp, my phone was already compromised. The first sign that I had that there was a problem was that I went to bed with a full battery and my phone plugged into my, uh, to my car, which charges even while the car is turned off, okay? And I woke up with a dead phone. It's like, that's, that's weird. So I, <coughs> used a solar charger to recharge my phone. And then three hours later, my battery is out again. Well, that's really weird. Okay, like batteries going out like that is a sign that something malicious on your phone is calling out, you know, trying to do something that's using your battery up. <coughs> so the basically the first thing I did in the morning on my first day in camp was I headed up to the legal tent, which was being run by the National Lawyers Guild. And I said, hey, so this thing is happening with my phone. Have you guys had the same sort of thing? And they were all like, oh my God, yes. This happened and this happened. Can you look at my phone? Can you look at my phone? And you know, it, it was very clear that everybody in that tent had something wrong with their phone. And even people walking in to get services had stories about, yeah, I was standing around, a plane flew overhead, and my, my phone died. And 
And I was like, so guys, have you thought about calling the EFF? And they were like, yeah, that'd be a great idea. Um, by the way, for those who don't know, that is uh, Cooper Quentin, uh, one of the technical guys at the EFF, and he's awesome. And he is hanging out with my monkey, worried monkey, where he travels with me and loves to have pictures taken with people. Um, so we called the EFF, <coughs> explained to them what we had seen, and they said, okay, great, we're gonna go down there and we'll take a look at stuff with you. So um, Cooper got me hooked up with a couple of applications on a, a cell phone that was, it was an MC Catcher Catcher phone, separate from my regular phone. Um, and we went around looking to see what cell towers there were, what was going on. <coughs> and, and we also went visually looking for things that were strange. Um, so this is the day that the North Camp was raided and cleared out. My brain has started to get fuzzy on dates. I think that's October 20th. Um, so, uh, this is like a few feet away from camp. Like the, the North camp is on that side of the road, just a little bit down. It had had between five and 10 people all the time because it was blocking where, um, Dapple had dug through burial grounds. They found out that there were burial grounds 24 hours later they started digging there. They dug there 20 miles away from where all of their other digging was. So they were clearly trying to put facts on the ground before somebody could say, you can't dig there because of the burial grounds. So when that happened, people came out, tried to stop them. A lot of people saw the, the footage from Democracy Now! with the dog bites. That was at that location. That's when the North Camp was established. So we had gotten word that they were going to raid the North Camp. And so about 300 people moved from the main camp up to the North Camp in order to make our own facts on the ground. <laughs> so, so this is people lining up. Um, and, and we're literally watching the cops in their military vehicles coming down the road here. And this is about 100 yards south of there. Now, you'll notice, I say, this is not a rural cell tower. Now, everybody that I asked who should know about this said two things. One, yes, the tower went in right after the North Camp went in, OK? Two, no, it's a real cell tower. It's from Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you know anything about the process it takes to, you know, get an environmental uh, impact, assessment. impact assessment for something like this uh, and, and all of the other paperwork, there is no way that in less than a week you get this thing up, uh, you know, in, in a normal way, in a, a legitimate way. Two, I don't know if you can see around here well enough to get the picture. Like, I, I swear to you, there are no houses over here. There are no houses over there. There are no houses behind my back. There are no houses around here. The, that serves nobody. <laughs> the only people that tower serves is the camp. That's it. And North Camp even. It doesn't even reach South Camp. And on my phone, when I stood near that tower, it showed up as an AT&T phone. And some other people standing in the same place, that tower showed up as a Verizon tower. <laughs> now, this is a terrible picture, because I didn't think about it at the time that I would need to show you how tall a rural cell tower really is. <laughs> but you kind of get the feeling. It does go a lot higher than that in the background. Um, the reason that I took this picture is because this guy right here is um, our dish. It's the geeks, the original Geeks Without Bounds dish before we got it moved out to the space near the casino. Um, 
that was to bring internet into camp, which is what I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but yes, you can tell the difference. That's what a real tower looks like. <coughs> so I'm like, dudes, they're, what I can tell, what is happening, we've got MC catchers. Do you know what an MC catcher is? A stingray, a fake cell tower, okay? So they've got MC catchers and they are passing our phone calls through these towers as if they were real towers so that they can listen in on our conversations and they're using over the air updates in order to put malware on our phones because there, there's no point at which they're getting a hold of our phones and putting malware on. That did happen, but I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but for the vast majority of us, we just came into the area and then bad things started happening to our phones, <coughs> right? Now the EFF said, this doesn't happen. Uh, an MC catcher can't pass the calls on to the regular service. And I said, yes, absolutely they could. And they said, no, no, I mean, they may be, it may be technically possible, but it would be way too expensive. And I argued, it's not that expensive. Um, in fact, the founders of Geeks Without Bounds used to be the ones who set up the OpenBTS cell phone system at uh, Burning Man. And they, you know, coordinated the contracts to connect that in with AT&T. And it wasn't that expensive. So it's possible, and it's not the end of the world, and you just function as a, as a roaming service for those other services. Um, so this was basically an argument that we continued to have, or debate, whatever. I love the EFF. We just disagreed on this issue. <laughs> um, they also said that they didn't believe that um, they could attack our phones with over-the-air uh, updates. Now, um, about a month ago, while I was continuing to do my research on this, I discovered that an article came out in October of 2016 that described exactly how you could use an MC catcher to uh, deliver over-the-air updates to Android and iPhones in order to insert malware on them. So now we know they are possible. Yeah? Did you have to accept these over-the-air updates? Right, so here's the thing. If you've got your phone set on automatic update, it automatically updates. <laughs> <laughs> no signature so th here's the thing that, that that article said. What that does is if it bops it down into 2G to do the update, that the signatures that come across on the 2G are weaker, and so therefore they're they're easier to fake. Yeah? There's also the baseband firmware on your phone, which they could infect via different means, and you could never even know that you're infected at that point. Exactly. And if you try to flash your phone and clear it, you still won't You still it. haven't, right. And that actually happened to me um, where even after flashing my phone and clearing my phone, I was not able to get rid of some of the problems my phone was having. I had to buy a new phone. And then actually this, um, this is my third phone since arriving at Standing Rock because the phone that I bought in December, um, I, was <laughs> I was out of town for a few weeks the day I returned home to my own home in Eastern Washington of all things. Um, the same day my mom was miraculously having weird things happening with her phone and her phone's a dumb phone for God's sakes, suddenly, my last phone went on the fritz and then like completely, it, it became unusable. It, um, so I don't know if you're familiar with uh, overlay malware. So, so it was, my screen would split in half and I'd have an overlay and I couldn't get rid of the overlay. And, um, <laughs> and I discovered right after the overlay happened that somebody had logged into my Google account. And I checked to see what was going on. Obviously, I changed my password. And then I checked to see what was going on. Well, they hadn't sent out any <coughs> emails using my Google account. They hadn't you know, done any of the things that you normally think of as malicious things happening on my Google account. What they did do 
was they went through a bunch of the files in my Google Drive that had names that I guess seemed interesting to them because one of them was a bash cheat sheet. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> did you factor authentication on your, on your Google account? At that point, I did not. That was the day I turned two-factor back on. Um, I had actually turned two-factor off while I was at Standing Rock because, and this is one of those things where, like, balancing the problems that you have when, when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you can sometimes get a phone call and sometimes can't get a phone call, but you have Wi-Fi access, and sometimes this works and sometimes that works. So I'd had several times where trying to use my two-factor authentication, I wasn't able to get into my own accounts, and I had to go all the way to the casino where I could get both a phone connection and an internet connection at the same time. <laughs> So I was like, ah, just turn off the two-factor authentication. That ended up being my undoing. <laughs> um, so, yeah? What was the legal justification for that? The for legal justification. Right? <laughs> so so that's, that's a thing. The legal repercussions, have we haven't seen the legal, legal repercussions yet because basically the EFF, the National Lawyers Guild, Geeks Without Bounds, um, and, and several other uh, entities are all working together to pull together all of the different evidence that we gathered while we were there and put together uh, a case or multiple cases about this. So we won't know what the legal repercussions are for a long time to come. Like this, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you have, if you have thoughts in your head that maybe I'm just like really paranoid, um, I, I just want to show you some of the stuff that we got to see at camp. Like, the, these are our neighbors at camp. <laughs> this is an LRAD. I, I was going to download the sound of the warning when they say that the LRAD is about to sound and then the uh, you know initial beep, beep, beep. But I thought that that was a little bit too cruel. And also, if there's anybody here that actually was at Standing Rock, it might give you, you know, triggery. Yeah, so I didn't. But LRAD trust me. Huh? What LRAD stands for? LRAD is the... Long Range Acoustic Device. Thank you very much. <laughs> Long Range Acoustic Device. It basically really makes a really radio loud radio. noise that if they turn it up high enough, can liquefy your insides. Um, but they don't generally turn it up high enough to liquefy your insides, but they do break eardrums and cause extreme pain. They are extremely painful. Um, and this is just one of the things that they, I mean, they used them on us during actions, but they also sometimes used this equipment on us recreationally. Um, and uh, this is, I nicknamed this the Happy Yellow Helicopter. It was not the only um, he helicopter or airplane over us. But basically, we had something over our head nearly 24-7. Um, some of these vehicles that were overhead had, this one doesn't, I don't, I don't see any things underneath it that you wouldn't expect. But some of them had, had bumps and things like that underneath. And we had some of the vets look at some of the pictures and ask them, you know, what do you think this is? And, and some of them identified things that were on there, including um, airborne MC catchers. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that lines up with some of the evidence that I have because my MC catcher catcher device claimed that there were cell phone towers in the middle of camp where there were no cell phone towers. Uh, and I walked with a couple of the other people in my crew around camp looking to see if there were cell phone boosters in the locations that our phones were claiming that there were cell phone towers. And we did not find, you know, in these cases, we did not find boosters in this location either. So what we think is that what we were seeing on the map was that the phone was picking up the location of the device on the plane at a specific moment as it passed overhead. That's the best we can figure. Um, one of the things that happened to us there, I, I mentioned this before, you'd be hanging out, 
and a plane flies overhead and all of a sudden your battery dies, okay? Now, my first initial analysis of this is it's an MC catcher because one of the things that MC catchers do is they uh, force your phone to drop off of its current network so that it will grab you on its network, okay? And if they put that up very high, it runs down your battery very fast. This is the first time I'd ever heard of batteries running out within seconds as a plane flew overhead, but who knows? But then, upon you know, deeper investigation, what we were finding was that people's, you know, whatever your battery was, if it was 80% or 60%, the plane would fly overhead, your phone would be dead. You plug the phone in, and as soon as you plug it in, it pops back up to 60%. Um, we, we started kind of going some sort of EM weapon? We don't know. We have no idea. We sent descriptions of the things that were happening off to uh, the Chaos Communication Congress when that happened, and we're like, can you guys figure out what this is? And they were like, mm, some sort of EM weapon? And we were like, yeah, that's what we said, too. <laughs> We, we have no evidence of this EM web, you know, this is not a thing where I could say, oh yes, this is a device that we know exists. We're just going, what else would do that? <laughs> Don't know. Um, so there were, there were a few things like that that just made us go, what the heck? Okay, now here's where we get into the, my stuff got out of, uh, out of order and I didn't fix all of it. Use Signal. <laughs> in, in a few slides from now, I'm going to tell you to encrypt all the things. Um, and Signal, I know some people are concerned because Signal is like a specific corporation, and any time a corporation has access to any of your stuff, that's a question. Um, and if you're, if you're using everything only on your phone, then you, some people say, well, then it's all okay because it's only encrypted on your phone. But if you're using it on your phone and your computer, then there has to be a way for it to be decrypted in two locations. So what's sitting on their server? Um, but in all of that, uh, I can't say that I have personally spent the time to uh, do the code review. I am not that kind of a math genius to be able to say, oh yes, this encryption, it rocks. Um, and so there are certain things where I'm like, I'm gonna trust the people who are the experts at that. Every reliable code reviewer that I know who has reviewed this code <coughs> has said, yes, this is good, with the exceptions being that when somebody has found a, a problem, Signal has fixed it very fast. So because of their responsiveness, because of the fact that so many people keep reviewing and re-reviewing and pounding on it, um, I, I do trust Signal. I don't trust WhatsApp because Facebook owns WhatsApp. <laughs> and Facebook themselves has admitted that they're able to man in the middle without you knowing. Um, oh, one of the other things was Signal. So I was on a Signal call with uh, Lisa Ling, who's one of the whistleblowers, the drone whistleblowers in the movie National Bird. And um, she's also a, a staff member at Geeks Without Bounds now. Um, she's starting our drone program, which is gonna be launched in August. Uh, sign up for our newsletter and find out all about it. Uh, but anyway, so we, we were on a signal call and our signal call dropped. And when we connected our signal calls back up, it didn't have like it didn't show that it was encrypted. So like we could tell that our encryption had failed. So we like immediately hung up and got back on the phone, a, you know, a third time. And this time it showed that it was encrypted properly. <laughs> so that helps me trust Signal more that I had an incident like that. Now, um, both of us have the logs from that and we hope to hear back from Signal whether it was just a, you know, what whether we were really being attacked or whether it was just a technical oops that happened to happen on that call. 
we are paranoid and yes, they really are watching us, but sometimes technical oopses happen. So my issue with Signal is that it's still running on a cell phone and you don't own the baseband, so you therefore don't own the system. Yes. <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but there there is no 100% safe anything that isn't, I mean, person to person in a cave. And even in the cave, who knows what they've put there, right? I mean, <laughs> um, so yes, one of the concerns that I had um, using Signal while I was at camp was that as our phones kept getting attacked, right? It's like, well, if they can see our, if they can see our screen, if they're able to pull things off of our phone, um, if they're key logging, doesn't matter that I'm using Signal. If they're able to do any of those things, it won't matter that I'm using Signal. So in each of these things, you kind of have to figure Am I protected in the other ways the best I can possibly be protected? But always be aware that, you know, it's so <laughs> I, ho I hope that this crowd does not find this too rude. There's no such thing as safe sex. There's only safer sex. And there's no such thing as safe cell phoning or text messaging or phone calls or emails. They're safer, not safe. Yeah. So my worry is if they own the baseband firmware, they could actually read the memory out of your phone and dump the encryption key out of the application's memory itself and decode your call without you even knowing. So yes, they could, but this is that's something that is a pretty high cost attack on oh, you. Like they have to pwn your phone first. They have to know that they're going after you. They have to pwn your phone first. Then they have to get the um, encryption key and, and then they have to decrypt your phone calls while your phone call is happening. Also, I believe right? Signal only uses the key to generate its own in-session key that it then randomly That's what changes. I'm talking about the baseband firmware compromising. They would have to be in the middle the then to get that handshake and then reattach themselves to the connection again. Each no, time. From the baseband, just reading it right out of the phone's memory. It's not a problem with signal, though. No, it's a problem with it being a cell phone. Right, yeah. right it's a problem with it being a cell phone. Exactly. That's why I say there's there's no such thing as safe phone. There's just safer phone. Well, yes, and but you use a not phone device that you own the firmware. Um, no such thing. Yeah, I mean, if you own the firmware, where's how are you? What about the other person you're talking to? Right, exactly. What about the other person that you're talking to? And, and also, um, what are you using for your encryption in that phone call or that voice call between you and them? And, and if we're going to get into radios, so uh, if you have an amateur license in the US and you're using encryption for voice calls over a radio, that's illegal. You just lost your FCC license. Boom. Wow. Not good. <laughs> so I mean, it's, th this is a, it's a problem. Yeah, I agree. Did you get any idea about who was behind all all of this? I mean, this is this is pretty expensive technology. It is, right? It's not something you would expect okay. from cops, right? So, <laughs> so actually, I do have. So I have speculation. I don't have proof. And this is another thing where, like, when people would ask me, "Did this work? Did that work?" I'm like, "Ask me in ten years." Right. I mean, it, I'm sure that in 10 years from now, we'll have enough people that were on the inside spilling the beans that will know what happened now. But um, so we know that Tiger Swan was involved. We know that Tiger Swan actually on their website advertises that they can do all this stuff. Uh, right. <laughs> we know that Morton County Sheriff's Department got buco bucks from both the federal government and from uh, ETP to help support this effort, right? And we know that the US government sells military equipment to law enforcement. And we know that the National Guard was involved, so the National Guard had their equipment. So what I think happened, and we have lots of other evidence of cooperation between the law enforcement agencies and the mercenaries. Um, so what I think happened was 
Morton County got equipment and Tiger Swan ran the equipment. That's what I think happened. Um, also, Morton County Sheriff's Department was, they, they were handing out deputy badges like candy at a parade. If you were a white boy and had a snowmobile, you could come be a deputy in late December and January. Yeah? Yeah, so I've got a background in the military so way back. So one thing I want to point out to particularly you is that crypto is not 100% ever, even in the military. It's how long is it going to take them to know what you've done, right, your communication. So the question is, is will they crack it? If they really want to, they will crack it. It's how long will it take and how expensive is it? So the first protection is don't be interesting. <laughs> when you're in the camp, you are interested. Oh, yeah. When you're here talking about it, you are not so interested. So um, just keep that in mind. Crypto is not a panacea. It's a, <coughs> a fence they have to climb over. I would like to point out in relation to cost, this is the kind of attack that a nation state or a large independent subcontractor for nation state and military companies like Tiger Swan right. would develop and would be an off-the-shelf tool that you could then use this exact type if, of attack to if it isn't if it isn't yet it will be i i absolutely agree with you but but i think that <coughs> at least at this point it's also it's still a question of um what is your individual risk factor and we saw at camp too that there were different attacks that were aimed at different people so myron dewey was one of the first people that got a like a, a WTF attack on his phone. It, it wasn't just acting weird. The battery wasn't just dying really fast. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't any of that normal stuff. His iPhone, you know, the one that everybody thinks is the most secure phone, his iPhone started turning on the sound recorder randomly. Um, and, you know, I thought about it and I was like, so if, if your sound recorder is going to turn on in an obvious way so that you know that they're recording you, there's two possibilities. Either they're really sloppy or this is part of the psychological warfare. Now, at first I was like, what kind of idiots would, and then I was like, oh, oh, yeah, they wanted him to know. <laughs> um, so, I talked about uh, having an MC Catcher Catcher. This is the software that I recommend. Um, of the two pieces of software that I used extensively, this is the one that I actually found useful and easy to use. You have to sideload it onto your phone. Uh, you can't get it off of Google Play. Um, <laughs> sorry, man. Uh, but it's really useful and it will give you a map of known cell towers, uh, and it also rates the cell towers that it sees with this handy dandy, you know, colorful aid. The, the last one, by the way, is they are looking at your phone. They want you get out of there now. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. That's what it says in the wiki. <laughs> um, so the other application that was on the device that uh, Cooper from the EFF gave me is this one called Snoop Snitch. Now the thing about Snoop Snitch is that only certain phones work with it. It has to be a Qualcomm based Android phone um, uh, because the it works with certain whatever's in the chipset. Uh, if I understand it correctly, it's actually a bug in the chip set instructions that allows it to do what it does um but uh which is never really a good thing to base your security tool on <laughs> um but it's worth looking into you may like it better than i did um so i just wanted to show you a, a few other images from camp because people seem to like 
images of camp. That, that's that a fucking thing. rocket launcher. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. why did they have a rocket launcher pointed at us? Oh, shit. They didn't like our drones. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> they were shooting our drones down out of the air. Um, they know that's what? a federal crime, right? Yeah. Yes, they do, and they didn't care. <laughs> and And, like... Our side is actually in court over this, continuing so in I've court. So I've got to ask, do you, do you know who specifically was operating the rocket launcher? Because this might be a very, very bad side effect of the issue of selling old military hardware to sheriff's departments. <laughs> because that, that, is, that is, regardless of someone's political stance, that is the most wrong thing that could possibly happen. Right, and, and this is pointed directly at camp. It's not pointed like out away from camp it this is on the hill above the main camp with men women children elderly people disabled people you name it there were and at the time that this was up there there were probably about 7000 people in camp what's that saying about muzzle discipline <laughs> right <laughs> Well, yeah. they, I mean, they're, they're, you probably have a few people in the room that are firearm enthusiasts, and I know that if I were to so much as point a weapon in the wrong direction, I will go to prison on weapons charges. Yeah, so what the... I mean, if I were to point a rocket launcher at someone... <laughs> yeah. It would be a domestic terrorist. I mean, yeah. what are you... The comment from the other end of the room is you're also not yeah. the National Guard. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the National guess. Guard. That is not the police. I promise you that. And are you actually saying that they fired a missile? They, um... They fired some rocket thing out of that at a drone. Actually. Actually at a drone and took a drone down. Now prior to that, yeah, that particular thing. Now prior to that, they had been, you know, the, the first thing that they shot it with, um, I'm not sure what it was. It was something that, or no, the first thing that they shot it with was just a rifle. So the first drones that went down had bullet holes and one of them actually still had you know, a bullet lodged in it. Then the next round of, we're going to get your drones, they had something that seemed to disrupt the, the radio signal. Because basically what you saw in the videos, and if you go look at um, Myron Dewey's uh, YouTube channel or his, his Facebook page, uh, Digital Smoke Signals, you'll see some images where the... Um, uh, you're, you're looking down at the, the sheriffs and then all of a sudden the image goes wobbly and then the image comes back but then everything goes and then it falls out of the sky. So, um, so that was the next thing and, and then they brought that out which was like the most absurd. Really? We're talking about, you know, Phantom Fours here. <laughs> so so that's, why, that's why I'm kind of pointing... You were saying they actually fired a missile, which is about three or four inches across, actually, in, in that particular missile. So I, I, I do not know. I, I do not know what the weapon. Well, I know they never fired those. Um, something came off of that vehicle that shot at a drone. There is there is okay, footage well, of it. Yeah. So Interesting. All right. I I did not personally witness, okay, but there was footage. <laughs> well, I have to know with this level of force, um, there is legal. Not, I mean, air quotes, legal justification for this, and it would be under things like the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So the only way, I mean, they could, in theory, justify that, but they would have to have at least some fig leaf labeling the camp a terrorist camp. But again, with, as you say, elderly people and children, it's kind of like, right, there's exactly. There's terrorism going on where you have elderly people and children. It's not. So, you know, still, so the issue there. is, um, and I. I think I'm going over time. I might be getting kicked. I see people like lining up outside. Um, but the issue is that as far as far as they were concerned, we were threatening a vital national infrastructure. And that is the basic justification for declaring a state of emergency and bringing out the National Guard and everything else. Um, by, by being there and by, you know, saying don't do this. So I just want to, one last thing before we go. Um, if you find yourself in, um, in an environment like this, um, Wireshark, I, I call it frenemy because 
it's the bad guy when somebody else is using it to snoop my traffic, but it's the good guy when I'm using it to find out what's happening with my, my devices, right? If my devices are calling home, I want to see what's happening. I, you know, even if I can't see the encrypted packets, I want to see what, um, what IP addresses it's trying to go to. I want to get as much information as I can to, you know, both build the, the case and try to protect myself. Uh, so yeah. if you don't know how to use Wireshark, learn how to use Wireshark. And I'll call that good because that's 55 minutes out of my 45 minute talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Would it have been feasible to put your phone into airline mode? Just use a trusted Wi-Fi? Oh, wait. No, actually, that is something that we did. And even in, air, in airplane mode, um, we had batteries die in airplane mode. Well, that reinforces the EM thing. Yeah. Right. That reinforces the EM thing. Um, so, but what we told people to do was to turn off their automatic updates when they were in the Standing Rock area. Nobody who had automatic updates turned off got malware unless their phone was stolen at some point. And that's something that happened. People's phones would disappear and then suddenly show up in their bag again. But aside from that, if your automatic updates were turned off, you did not get malware. Oh yeah, I, I told everybody to password lock their phones, don't use a fingerprint. I'm interested in hearing there was a description, part of the description that said, um, how do you deal with trust issues when there are staff continually rotating? How did you deal with that? People come in and say, I have technical skills. Yeah, so that is actually, that's a huge problem. We we started playing a game called <laughs> Asshole or Infiltrator. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so basically the, the way that I ended up dealing with it was having different levels of trust for different jobs that needed to be done. And if I didn't you know, know a person, they weren't going to do the things that had access to passwords for things so or keys for things. Applied to how well I know you. Right. <laughs> how well I know you personally or, or the circle of trust that you're in. Like if somebody else that I trust very highly speaks of you and says, I trust very highly of this person, I, I would, the longer I was there, the more I would interrogate that. Like how long have you known them? Where do they work? Where did you know that from? Like, <laughs> because it got more and more. Um, oh, shoot. One of the pictures that isn't on here. One of the infiltrators came in, disabled a solar system, cut a, a POE, a power over Ethernet cord, and then took down one of our um, nano beams because the nano beam has the keys on it to get onto the network. And so by, by destroying the solar system first, then when they cut the ethernet cord, it wouldn't zap the nano beam, and they would be able to take an, a functional nano beam elsewhere, point it at our nano beam, because those things have a 10 mile range. Uh, <laughs> so as soon as we discovered that that was missing, I had to change all the passwords on our entire network. The, the mesh network system. It was Thank you. Fun, great fun. Where yeah. could I find your slides, possibly? Uh, I should probably make the slides better. Uh, do you want these slides as bad as they were? I will. I will put them up on guab.org. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> G W O B geeks without bounds. GWOB.